In Pima County alone, there are more than 170 public water systems. Some are big, like Tucson Water, which has more than 700,000 customers. But most of them are small. Some serve just a neighborhood with maybe a couple hundred customers or even less. A small company means not a lot of money and some tight margins. And wells are not cheap. A domestic well costs tens of thousands of dollars, let alone a municipal well. So, it's easy to wonder how water companies that don't have a municipal government backing them keep the wells running. And what happens when one breaks? This is Tapped, a podcast about water. I'm Zach Ziegler. On this episode, what goes into running the small water companies that dot our state? Joining me now is AZPM environmental reporter Katya Mendoza. Welcome, Katya. Hi, Zach. Thanks for having me. So, how did you get started on this topic and why? Well, let's start with a why. Back in March, the only drinking water well in the unincorporated community of Y went dry. The well failed because of a hole in the casing, most likely due to rising surface water temperatures that caused premature deterioration of equipment. The Y well maintenance operator Bill Hadley said wells should last somewhere between 40 and 50 years. But in this area, because the water temperature sits at about 103 to 105 degrees, Once it reaches the surface, instead of cooling down, it remains hot. Hadley said pumps and motors only last for about three to five years. So less than one-tenth of the expected lifespan. I mean, that just boggles the mind. I'm guessing that this is one of those small water companies that I talked about in the intro. About how many residents depend on this public water system, and how were they getting their water when it wasn't working? Hadley said about 110 residents, as well as a well-staffed border patrol station nearby, and an RV park which sees anywhere between 300 to 400 seasonal visitors. The community had been hauling in water from the nearby town of Ajo, which had become quite expensive. It cost about $360,000 just to bring in water. That was 60% of the total cost of this entire situation. So what's the story on how this got fixed? Towards the end of May, the Wide Domestic Water Improvement District, a.k.a. DWID, asked the Pima County Board of Supervisors to declare a state of emergency for the area of Y in hopes of receiving financial support. Hauling water on top of well maintenance fees had created an unsustainable financial burden. As soon as the DWID knew the well was going to be down for more than a day, they called the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, the local fire station, and Border Patrol, as well as other board members. After about three months and $560,000 later, they were able to install a new 8-inch steel casing, which has been working fine ever since. Hadley said that they revised their emergency operations plan to include more names of resources, as well as ensuring maintenance happens more frequently, every three to five years instead of five to six. The well was fixed in June through combined efforts between the y DWID, ADEQ, and Pima County Department of Environmental Quality. So how were they able to fund this expensive endeavor being such a small company? So the White Dwid received a $50,000 grant from ADEQ to help fund the new equipment, and they also received a $200,000 grant from the National Rural Water Association to help cover costs. I will also mention that because the Y DWID is working with a smaller budget for water, and because they're a public district, their rates only cover basically what it costs to run every year. Every district is different based on their population, cost of running, etc. Hadley said that Y is up to about 111 water meters in town, so the cost of running the district has to be divided up between those 111 customers. So it's a balancing act of trying to keep costs low and the service low enough. So what happened with the request to declare a state of emergency? Hadley had said the YDWID was advised by various groups of people that due to their financial situation and length of the well being down, that it was probably time to declare an emergency. But they found out that technically it is not an emergency until there is no water for four hours. 
I will say that Hadley mentioned that the YDWID is also in the process of getting some serious funding from the USDA Rural Development Office to drill a new well and build a new treatment plant, which they're hoping will be completed over the next two to three years. So how much is the funding for that project? They're looking at about $6.2 million. They've submitted the applications, paperwork, preliminary engineering report, and now they're just waiting for the USDA approval so they can start the process of getting a bridge loan to start designing. All right, let's take a step back here to just this overall project. What is a DWID exactly? A DWID is like a governing board. Hadley, who I mentioned earlier, was a board member of this DWID. PDEQ Environmental Quality Manager Jennifer Lynch says DWIDs used to be overseen by the County Board of Supervisors, but to avoid a conflict of interest, the board has stepped back and the DWID board members are elected, typically. So now we have seven DWIDs that meet the threshold of 50,000 customers or less that have been transferred as of May 29th, 2023, from ADEQ to PDEQ, and now we have primacy for those seven systems. This led me to the Marana Picture Rocks Water Treatment Campus. It's really inconspicuous. It's right behind a sports bar, a Lutheran church, and a pet supply store, in between a community park that I actually used to play at when I was younger. My parents live in the area and get their water from that facility, as it turns out. So believe it or not, not a lot of people know where their drinking water comes from or how it's treated. Although people have definitely heard of the term PFAS, the Marana Public Water System is one of the few facilities in Pima County that treats for PFAS. I've been to a PFAS treatment site operated by Tucson Water for another AZPM show. I'm going to throw in a shameless plug here for an episode of The Buzz that we did last September. We were by Tucson International Airport, and the site was surprisingly small. It it was like an oversized residential lot. What was this site like? Well, if you travel up a dirt road, you'll reach a huge water storage tank and other large tan painted structures. Normally, the gate would be closed, but I was greeted by Kalana Brittenbaugh from Marana Water and Jennifer Lynch from PDEQ and a few other water quality specialists at the Picture Rock site to talk about how drinking water is treated and how a public water system is maintained. Kalana showed me the ropes and the step-by-step process of how groundwater is treated. Today we are at the Picture Rocks Water Treatment Campus. This treats both for PFOS and 1,4-Dioxane using UVAOP and granular activated carbon. And that's what we're we're taking it down to less than 0.001%, so parts per trillion. So we are doing a magnificent job over here. I would say this would be the start of our process. This is our wellhead. It's bringing up well from the ground, from the aquifer. I would like to say that this is probably about 400 feet deep and it pulls water around 280 feet deep and it's coming up as raw water no treatment no anything at first it comes across this header well right here as we come across this way this is pretty much the start of our treatment now Kalana just mentioned raw water what does that mean so in this instance it's water with contaminants or sediments such as sand and rocks In 2018, the Town of Marana Council made the decision to construct a water treatment facility for two impacted systems in Marana water that were found to contain unregulated compounds of PFAS and 1,4-Dioxane. These unregulated compounds currently don't have a maximum contaminant level applied by EPA, but do have applicable health advisories. Walk me through the process of treating this water. So we entered the sedimentation zone. This is pretty much the start of our treatment. Where desanders remove big things that you can see with your eyes, such as rocks, debris, sand, everything like that. And from there... Our bag filters that we have there, it removes, I would say, like the silt and the finer things that we have. Once it goes through there, where you see that silver line right there, that's our static mixer. That's where we enter in our 35% less than hydrogen peroxide. It turns the water over. So now our water, when it comes through here, is sediment-free, and we are putting initializing the hydrogen peroxide. So you're at the water treatment facility. What do some of these structures look like? The way Kilana described it, if you're looking at the well, you're looking at a 200-horsepower pump motor. That goes down, and it travels down. I would, Off the top of my head, I want to say at least 400 feet. Inside, there's a casing with certain perforations or holes 
between 100 and 200 feet. And when that pump turns on... There are bowls way, way, way down there. They fill up with water from the aquifer. The pump sucks it up from there, and it comes across the wellhead and past... That blue thing that you see right there? A check valve. So as soon as the water goes past there and it pumps it out, it can't come back. So as long as there's positive pressure coming from our wellhead, it continues out. As soon as the well turns off, it stops. All the water stops right there. The remaining fall down in there, but that's pretty much how that well motor operates. It gets oiled whenever it turns on. We have to oil it to make sure that it doesn't have too much heat and blow up. So imagine a casing is a, just a large tube that runs from the ground surface down to the aquifer. And it's a way to siphon the water from the um, aquifer up to up top to have us be able to access it. So imagine a tube, if it's um, completely solid, the pressure is gonna be a lot better and easier to draw the water up. If there's any holes or perforations in that casing, it's going to allow sediment to infiltrate the casing and contaminate the water, and you're gonna just not have enough pressure to draw that water up. And that's what happened in that case with Widewid. Okay, so that's a wellhead in a nutshell. Correct. I happened to ask Kalana how long the equipment is supposed to last, and he said everything has a shelf life, but depending on preventative maintenance, it could run anywhere between 5 and 20 years. We heard about those hot well temperatures in Y earlier. Arizona has some pretty extreme temperatures, and these pumps are sitting outside. How does all of this heat factor into maintenance? He said that it does affect the life of the machinery, which is why there is a shade structure covering the wellhead. When the motor is actually running, it does help keep the, the, the heat from the motor itself that it creates. With the outside ambient heat, the shade structure keeps it cool enough to where it doesn't ever have to worry about overheating or getting too hot to where it can't do its job. So who's in charge of that maintenance? So public water systems may be publicly or privately owned or even federally, such as the one at Davis-Monthan Air Force Base. Jennifer Lynch says it depends on the organizational structure of the water system. Some are co-ops, some are HOAs, uh, you know, some are municipalities like this. It's uh, some have a well share agreement between all of the users and there isn't a lot of structure. And those are the ones that we, I would say we have the most interaction with because they need, they're just small systems. They have a certified operator, but the day-to-day stuff they're not really involved with. So we, that's where we get involved to sort of help them out. Since PDEQ oversees 172 systems, they do send out inspectors and conduct anywhere between 50 and 60 inspections a year. They look at motors, piping, items in the piping such as check valves, cleanliness, that the property is fenced. They're following checklists. So in my reporting on other stories, I've found a lot about well regulation is done at the state level by either Arizona Department of Environmental Quality or maybe the State Department of Water Resources. How did this job end up with the county instead? The state delegated certain duties and functions for public water systems to Pima County, and one of those duties is sanitary surveys. We need to account for all of the structures that are on the property, storage tanks, booster pumps, chlorinators, those sorts of things. I'd say a fair amount of the work is done ahead of the inspection, and then really it's the boots on the ground just verifying the the information that we have and making sure that it's correct. Um, Again, they have to submit monthly samples to the state, so we know that um, they're up to date on all of their sampling and they're not exceeding any of the MCLs or maximum contaminant levels. All right, we've heard about a lot of equipment. That's a lot of moving parts. This story started with a well not working. What happens if something breaks? Great question. I asked Kalana the same. They also have an emergency plan of operations. And for this specific water system, there is a spare wellhead motor that's available. And while they might lose about a day's worth of water, there's another source nearby. Actually, we have a different well about... I would say roughly 300 yards more east of this that also feeds this treatment campus. So where you see this line coming in, where that valve is right there, that's where one feeds like that. So one well turns on and the other well turns on. So if this well would go down, we'd pretty much turn it off and the other one would take over in its place while this one were to be fixed. And then it would go back into rotation and we'd start all the process all over again. So we might lose a a day with this motor, but we wouldn't lose actually any water flow or any any demand loss, we would have it covered completely. Kalana said that when they first started doing this treatment campus, they had to rebuild the well motor itself. 
supposedly the initial wiring was faulty and ended up frying itself whenever it was turned on. That was the most recent event, and that happened about three years ago. Luis Valencia, the chief water quality operator, said that there are also plans to tie this water system into another water system. So that would help a lot as far as capacity to, to uh, provide water to this area. And a plus side on that is it's actually non-contaminated water. It's a couple of wells, the Hartman Vista water system, all owned by the town of Marana, and one day they will become one. It's just a matter of connecting and talking to each other and, of course, Pima County approval. So what's the benefit of that happening? Water supply, redundancy, and the non-contaminated well sources to the east. Not all aquifers are contaminated with PFAS and 1,4-dioxane. The plume doesn't exist out there. And PFAS is a huge issue right now. Out of curiosity, how common is it for water systems to have to clean it out of the water? Well, ADEQ sampled 102 systems recently, and about a quarter have PFAS detections, with a few test results still outstanding. These numbers come from single samples that began in late February. ADEQ will begin sampling for a second time at least 90 days after the first system. Jennifer Lynch says that each system has monthly sampling for total coliform, which is a group of bacteria parasites, viruses, or pathogens. There's a variety of other um, contaminant samples that need to be taken. Um, For example, lead and copper, that's done. uh, Each water system has its own sampling schedule, uh, depending on past results. So some water systems only sample once a year for lead and copper, others are twice a year. It kind of depends. Each one is a customized uh, sampling plan. In 1991, the EPA enacted guidelines to test for lead and copper levels in residential properties. Just a few years before the Marana Water Department was established in 1997. And before that, in 1974, there was the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is a broad federal regulation that dictates certain standards for drinking water systems throughout the country. Everything is a tiered approach, so that uh, Drinking Water Act is uh, promulgated by the EPA, um, and they, they delegate the the drinking water program to ADEQ, and then ADEQ delegates it to the counties throughout Arizona to do the day-to-day operations. So what happens if a customer calls their utility or the county with a complaint about water? Maybe it tastes funny, looks gross, there's no water pressure? The way Lynch describes it is that maintenance operators are pretty much on call. They really strive to have a local connection so that they're able to go out into the field and test for things like that. Of course, the farther certain customers are geographically, the more challenging it is to feel a connection. Kalana did say something about day-to-day operations and how they depend on any given day. There are some days where I would come to work and I'll take samples of the PFOS 1-4 at the wellhead at our treated water after treatment. There are days where I come to work and I do backflow inspections and backflow input of data on the data portal that we have there are days when we come to work and I do tours and stuff like this and I train kids on water usage and the water flow of water at schools he said mostly third and fourth graders do the tours so a lot of their questions is mainly where water comes from and do I drink like poop water so that's mainly the main (laughs) thing of like letting them know you don't drink recycled poop water you don't drink anything like that water pretty much falls from the sky eventually hits the ground through time will go through the its own treatment through the ground get stripped of all its minerals, whatever it can be, and it ends up in our aquifer years from now, and we'll eventually pump that up. And that's the water that we drink. Like water that we're drinking now is from years and years ago that has trickled down to the aquifer. Well, leave it to the tweens to ask the important questions, and thankfully, Kalana has a nice, concise answer ready to go. Absolutely. Curiosity knows no age. Katya, thanks for taking us to the kind of place that most of us get our water from and telling us the story of how it gets to our pipes. Thanks for having me. Until next time, and keep those questions flowing. (laughs) Tapped is a production of AZPM News. This episode was mixed by me, Zach Ziegler. Our editor is our news director, Christopher Conover. Our theme music is by Michael Greenwald. Visit our website in the podcast section of azpm.org for pictures, links, and more. Thanks for listening.